is the who. Ron Paul, Republican congressman from Texas and candidate for president. Congressman, good to see you. Thank you very much. Congressman, you've created a stir by proposing the elimination of an agency that's gotten very high marks in this part of the country over the last few days. If you were successful in getting rid of FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, what or who would carry out its functions? Well, the, st the states would. You know, your uh, uh, state guards would be within the states and they wouldn't have to go out looking for more help. Uh, since the helicopters from Vermont are over in Iraq, that would be one thing that we could help. We'd have the troops here at home that could help on recovery. But, you know, not high on my agenda is getting rid of FEMA. It's just that it's only been around a short period of time and it's developed a very bad reputation. I live in a coastal district and we deal with FEMA all the time and it's the agency of government that I get the most complaints about. And there's better ways to solve these problems uh, and they, they don't have a very good record. All you have to do is go and, and look at all the articles written about uh, Katrina and some of the uh, mix-ups that, uh, uh, that FEMA got involved in there. But, but so I'm I, just saying there's a better way of doing it. But if I may, uh, uh, FEMA has gotten rave reviews over the last couple of days in some of the states and from some of the governors who you say should take over. The governor of Vermont today, Peter Shumlin, said he'd like to see you come there. The, go the Democratic governor of Connecticut, as you know, called you an idiot. The Republican governor of Jersey, Chris Christie, and of Virginia, uh, ridiculed the notion that you and Eric Cantor in the Congress are advancing that for every dollar in disaster relief should there be an offsetting dollar <laughs> in tax cuts. What do you know that they don't, Congressman? Well, no, but uh, that doesn't that sound like a rather reasonable thing? We're in a financial crisis because the debt is unmanageable. Nobody will even raise the debt limit. But, so why isn't it reasonable to say that, you know, if you need it, uh, I'm all for that. Matter of fact, even back, uh, you know, when the hurricanes hit in Katrina and in Texas there, in uh, New, uh, New Orleans and Texas, I proposed that very thing. Uh, uh, save a couple billion dollars from overseas, uh, put half of it to the deficit, and put the other half toward taking care of the problems we have. When people, don't, when people talk like this and dismiss the deficit as not a problem, I, I've heard those governors say, get the aid here. You know, what they want to do is they want to pass the buck. That's why they like the federal government. That means if anything fails, it's not the governor's fault, it's no local people's fault. It's always the federal government. Go after the president. You know, if it doesn't work, it's the president's fault. But it's even, it's even fiscally conservative Republicans who've chimed in. Let's go back. You said, let's bring it home. You mentioned your district, Galveston, a coastal community right. is in your district. Totally true to your beliefs. When Hurricane Ike hit, I guess in what, 2008, you voted against the multi-billion dollar appropriation right. for federal disaster relief. Despite that, hundreds of millions of federal dollars came in your district. What, a hundred some million paid for a wastewater treatment plant. So didn't your constituents benefit with funding despite your opposition yeah. to it? Well, some people think short term and in front of their nose in the next election. And uh, I think when they take your money, you should try to get some of your money back. But I'm trying to reform the system so it's more efficient. But overall, FEMA's broke. They're $20 billion in debt. So for, you to, for anybody to say, you know, uh, these governments say, well, we don't want to raise the money. We're not responsible. The federal government is. Who's the federal government? It's the taxpayers. So put them into $10 billion more debt. Eventually, that all ends. I'm trying to prevent this catastrophic financial crisis that's on our doorstep. It's hardly even gotten started yet. It's going to get much worse because nobody really cares about the deficit. If they did in Washington, they wouldn't allow it to happen. And you get somebody like Eric Cantor who gets up and he says, you know, maybe we ought to pay for this. Then the media comes down hard on him. All he's trying to do is act responsibly. Well, let's talk to about, me, that's common sense. Let's talk about paying for things if we can. The president's going to give a job speech next Thursday, assuming the National Football League doesn't say no. <laughs> but putting that aside for a second, my, I'm assuming he will yet again call for an end to the Bush tax cuts for the wealthy and say, let's use that money for investment in infrastructure and deficit reduction. The vast majority of the American people support raising tax cuts on the uh, raising taxes on the wealthy. Aren't you out of step with mainstream America on that pretty critical well, issue? If I'd be out of step, you know, my numbers wouldn't be going up and I wouldn't have gotten reelected so often with growing numbers. But I would say the better way to do this rather than destroying the economy by raising taxes on the people who produce jobs is quit these wars. Bring the troops home. Let them spend their money here. Let, let, let's have a real stimulus package. We're, we're up to our ears in debt, trillions and trillions of dollars, and no end in sight for these wars. Then we could take care of our people. Matter of fact, I even proposed on many of these programs that I don't fully endorse because technically they're not permissible under the Constitution, but taking care of sick people, the elderly and the children, 
I have nothing against that if you cut the spending. But to raise taxes on the rich and chase more capital overseas, that's one of our basic problems with the economy right now. $1.5 trillion of capital sits overseas because there's no incentive to come home here because of all the regulations that are bearing down on them. You have to change that or you're not going to get any jobs. That's what my argument is. Congressman, I could not agree with you more on the wars, but let's talk about some people who don't agree. I think most people agree with you that you're the founding father of the Tea Party movement. You support small government across the board, but I think it's safe to say that many Tea Party members, lots of them, including some Tea Party leaders like Sarah Palin, Michelle Bachman, want small government here, but want large government overseas, uh, specifically things like support for the, for the Afghanistan war. So right. isn't it safe to say that their voice on issues of fiscal responsibility, the Tea Party, is simply not credible when they're saying, let's continue to spend those tens of billions of dollars that you and I both agree yeah. is money wasted. So who should listen to the Tea Party on money issues? Well, who? That's one thing for sure. The, uh, the uh, Tea Party is not monolithic. Obviously, it was started in our campaign four years ago, but there are a lot of people who joined who saw a wave coming, which was an anti-Washington wave, and it's an anti-deficit wave. But you're right, and, and this is what the election is all about, because it's going to be sorted out. And I think my views will prevail, but I have to prove myself. I have to be credible. I have to get the support. I have to get the votes. If I don't, then it's, I say, well, you know, the people want the wars and, and they want to run up debt and they want to keep having all these programs. And, and then it's all going to end because of the financial crisis. When the dollar quits functioning, the troops will come home. Just like the Soviet system collapsed, the empires do not last when they're overextended. And we're overextended and nobody wants to admit it. This country is bankrupt. So when you're bankrupt and you're facing this crisis, you have to admit it and you have to change your ways. And that's all I'm asking for is to change our ways and solve these problems. And we can do it in a transitional fashion if we wise up and, and, and do it uh, gracefully rather than waiting for a collapse. Let's talk about consistency and credibility. And you raised the concept a minute ago. I'm a big government kind of guy, but I have a lot of respect for you and a lot of your libertarian views, particularly around foreign policy. But can you explain to me who, how someone like you who believes government should stay out of our lives, also believes government should be able to tell a woman that she should have a child that she doesn't want. I don't understand how those two things fit together. Well, the, the libertarian principle is you're not allowed to use aggression against a, a person. And uh, I'm an OB doctor, and that person, uh, to me it was a person because I had legal responsibility for it. You know, a, a woman that's carrying a baby that's three, four, five, six pounds, if I do anything to it, I get sued. And uh, if you're in an accident and you are involved and that baby is, is killed, you, you have a, a big problem on your hand. This is a, a serious uh, legal matter. So I would say that it isn't a question of the woman and protecting her privacy as, as much as whether or not you can see a two or three or four or five pound baby that has not yet been born deserves legal rights. But isn't and I there come a down on the side of saying, that is a legal person, it's a human being, it's, and uh, it deserves to live. And, but, but your position goes beyond uh, both the, the, I guess, the philo philosophical and pragmatic as a former OBGYN. You, you see this as a constitutional issue, do you not? No, I've never brought up the Constitution. It's the pro-abortion uh, pro people to always bring it up and they introduce this, uh, this uh, uh, idea of privacy. No, constitutionally I bring it up only in the fact that I say the federal government shouldn't be in it. I don't believe in a federal uh, abortion police. Uh, you know, I don't, want, I don't want to have them have anything to do with it because I know how difficult it is. And, and although I think those who believe in abortion have to deal with an eight-pound baby one minute before birth, which they refuse to because right, right before birth, the mother's body is still precious and you should protect it. But they want to think uh, on the other end. Because there's so many difficult positions on that, I think it should be local. Different states have different viewpoints, and uh, I, I don't have a monolithic approach, and I don't talk about murder, and I don't talk about putting people in prison. I, want, I talk about respect for life. If you do not have respect for life, how can you have respect for liberty? I Quickly. am the greatest defender of liberty, but I do not, I can't see how I can justify all this defense of liberty if I don't defend life. Well, but, but very quickly, but can you said you didn't want a federal abortion police, then I believe, why did you vote for a ban on partial birth abortion on the federal level if you want it left to the states? I don't understand that. 
Because it was already nationalized by the courts, so I was trying to balance out okay. the nationalization by the courts. They made it a national permission. I wanted to cancel out the national permission and legalization by the courts. Uh, two final questions, if I can, just to finish up. One of the you have a big debate, obviously, next Wednesday night at the uh, Ronald Reagan Library. Correct me if I'm wrong. When you go there and you shake the hand of Governor Rick Perry, is it true that that will be the first time you've ever met the governor of your state for the last ten years? In my memory, you know, I've off, I've said that because I do not recall it. But you know, uh, he and I have been in Texas for a long time, and who knows, we might have passed some time along the way, and we shook hands. Don't you? But find no, I honestly do not recall ever personally meeting him. But isn't that? Do you not find that strange? I mean, it, it seems to me. Tell me if you think this is unfair. That it's it's sort of s symptomatic of two men who are more concerned maybe about going their own way than they are about working collaboratively for their constituents. You both served Texans for the same 10 years and beyond, no? Well, he, he worked a lot in Austin. I worked a lot in Washington. But it is true that uh, President, both George Bushes, I did get to know them, and I thought they were very cordial, and I got along with them quite well, uh, even though we had our same disagreements. You can imagine how much I disagreed with their foreign policy. But no, but George Bush uh, Jr., uh, I knew Junior. him pretty well, but he was he was always very very cordial and and polite to me. Hey. Uh, but no, I did not have that relationship. But I don't I wouldn't say it was me deliberately saying I'm going my way Got and it. he's going his way. It just happened that way, and I, I guess somebody else will have to sort out 30 exactly se why. Thirty <laughs> seconds, if we can. You just uh, had a birthday, correct? That is correct. Happy birthday. So if you're elected president, you'll be 77 years old when you take office. Oldest president to assume the office by far, seven years. I know firsthand how many young people are huge supporters of yours. But at 77, Congressman, aren't you too old to be president of the United States? No. I'm, as a matter of fact, I'm only 76. <laughs> you, you, I know, but you, you won't know, be president until you're you, 76. You know, you know I, I think people like you who do this, you should be careful about practicing age discrimination. You know, that's against the law, you know. It is. So be careful. I know good no, lawyers. You know what I do? You know what my answer is? Why do I appeal to the young people? Because I have young ideas. Freedom is a young idea. Why do the other ones have old-fashioned ideas? They want totalitarianism. They want power in government. So I am the youngest candidate with the youngest <laughs> idea. And besides, tomorrow, to prove it, I'm having a bicycle ride, and you're welcome to come. And I've challenged any of my opponents to come to Houston at noontime when the temperature is 100 and the humidity is 100, and I'll ride 20 miles with them. And then, then you'll have the right to ask me about my age or challenge me about my age. That's a fair deal. You look All fabulous, right. too. Congressman Paul, thank you so much. I hope we get to talk to you a lot Good. as the campaign goes thank, along. Thank you.